out. We won't say it's bad because we don't want to hurt you. But uh, we'll not do anything about it. You thought I'm going to let you just get away with it. I'm going to ask three questions. Three questions, and if you give the right answer, I'm going to throw you a gift. <laughs> Free gift. First question. When you drove into the parking lot of Metachin Assembly of God, there's a signboard. And what does that signboard say? Anyone? First hands up. Yes, Sister Cindy. Out of over 100 people, one person. Yes. <laughs> Obedience to Jesus solves many problems. God bless you. There you go. Second question. Second question. Last Sunday, Pastor Dave preached. And he spoke about what? Yes? No, no, no. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. You can go on. Yes. Talent, treasure, and time. Here you go. God bless you. And a week before that, I know it's getting hard. I know it's getting hard. The week before that, I preached parable of the sower, but that's not the question. Good answer. <laughs> Good answer. That's not the answer for my question today. For time, talent, and treasure, there's one more thing that I added, which I said a popular female preacher said. Yes. There. Tongue. God bless you. And a woman said that. That's very good. Oops, sorry. It's good to have fun in church, right? Christianity sometimes is so boring to people. They don't want to become Christians when they look at you and me. You guys are boring. I mean, where's the fun in Christianity? I mean, our God is so much filled with fun and adventure. He created this universe. He set it rolling. And of course, he's fighting an enemy, which we know in stages has already happened. And we are all in the midst of this battle. And we are supposed to engage something that is beyond us. So in order to get you back to the stage where I want to move with the message this morning is I spoke about the parable of the sower. The parable of the soils, as I called it. And it's found in three texts, Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. And the doctor, Luke chapter 8, the doctor Luke who wrote that, he gives us a kind of a heart checkup. So what does he do when we do a heart checkup? The four different types of people or the soils you find. So when I say heart and the soil, when we say heart, it means the innermost person. The person that has the intellect, emotions, and will. I told you it's not the physical heart. And I tried to make a comparison by saying it could be the brain, but it's even beyond the brain. Yes, the brain has got something going on. There's so many. They say there's 2 billion synapses, connections, electromagnetic connections that happen. That's why sometimes I wonder why people blow up. <laughs> they can just blow themselves up. Now I wonder why. Because there's all these electrical connections right there in the brain. And they say you have a short fuse. The fuse just goes off, right? And they lose it. They lose their mind. How can you lose your mind? So when I say the mind, that's when the scripture, the key scripture that I said we all need to memorize and know it by heart is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So there's a renewal that goes on in our mind that will create a new effect. So I've got some slides to just show you today. 
And I clearly told you that two weeks ago that there's no problem with the sower. There's no problem with the sower. The sower is God. Number two, there is no problem with the seed because the seed is the message of the kingdom. It's the good news. There's no problem with the seed. And there is no problem with the solution too. The solution, the effect will happen. But I told you the problem is with the soil. That is with our hearts. In Genesis it said, uh, before the destruction took place, he said, God said, I know the human heart. Every inclination of the heart, human heart, the thought is evil. And Jeremiah says in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is the most deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can cure it? Who can know it? Who can cure it? So there is a problem right here with the soil. There is a problem with our heart. So that's why I took you through the journey to show you that there are four types of people, groups that you can find. Number one is they do not know Jesus at all. They receive the word of God, and when they walk out, the enemy of the soul comes in, takes it away from their mind, and they're not saved. They think that they know. They think that they know about Jesus. They, they, they just do not know Jesus. They hear about him. Number two are the carnal Christians. I told you. They receive the word with joy, and for a period of time they hold on, and when the testing takes place, they fall away. There is a test to know whether this Jesus is real in your heart, whether something has happened. And when, when you're not able to stand the test, people fall away. That carnal Christians, because they are still ruled by their flesh. Number three is they're not only carnal, they're immature Christians. Why immature? Because he says they are choked by the deceitfulness of riches by the worries of the world. They are choked. They are so busy. Their minds are always occupied. Oh, I got to do this. I got to do this. Like some of you are already thinking, oh, what do I do? I have to do for lunch today? You're worried about your lunch. You're worried about, oh, what do I do in my house today? I got so much to do. I got to do this. I got to do that. You are choked. And when you're choked by these things, what happens there is no effect. They are the carnal and immature. They are Christians, but they are carnal and immature. There is no effectiveness, so to speak. And thirdly, he says, they are the mature and maturing, uh, fourthly, mature and maturing Christians who receive the word and they bear fruit a hundredfold. 30, 60, or a hundredfold. And this is where the problem is. We do not have mature Christians. We do not have mature Christians who know how to live the Christian life. And that's one of the reasons why the outside world, the people outside, they don't know. They look at you and they don't know that you're a Christian. It has to be self-evident. So I'm trying to get you into a problem and trying to elevate What's really happening in our hearts? What is, what is the problem here? There is a mystery. There's a mystery to me. If they say, if this is what, th these are the four kinds of people we have, mature, maturing Christians, but if the kingdom of God is not growing the way it is supposed to grow, there is a mystery involved. So how does the kingdom of God advance on this earth? Let's look at this. The next slide, please. The mystery of kingdom growth. And the text that I have for that is Mark chapter 4. And as I told you, Jesus spoke in parables. The word parable means placing alongside, meaning in comparison, he tells you, this is how it is. He literally spoke in parables. A theologian calls Jesus 
a metaphorical theologian. He literally spoke only in parables. Mostly, you look at the text, it's always in stories. He was just telling stories to people to try to get them understand. And this was one such story. And this is the mystery of the kingdom growth. And what does it say? This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. The seed just grows. It has to happen. But it's not happening. The mystery of kingdom growth. All by itself, the soil, your heart, will produce the grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. He's expecting something. From the soil of a heart, when things happen, when the seed, the word of God, penetrates deeply into your heart and mind, it will produce fruit. It has to. The mystery of kingdom growth, whether you sleep or get up, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. As long as the seed grows, seed goes in, the word of God penetrates deeply inside of you the effectiveness will be there. There will be effectiveness. Then we all say, yes, I've read the Bible. Yes, I'm doing this. I'm going to church. I'm, I'm doing everything what I can do. But is there effectiveness in our lives? Is there something happening? This is an adventure. This is fun. Walking with God is supposed to be like an adventure. The Lion and the Witch and the Wardrobe, which C.S. Lewis wrote in that story, the four kids, Peter, Edmund, Susan, and Lucy, they ask this Mr. Beaver, they look at Jesus, who's portrayed as a lion, or like a lion, Aslan. And as they look at Aslan, they're scared. And these four kids are staying outside and Watching, and Mr. Beaver says, safe? Of course he isn't safe. He's not safe, but he's good. I tell you, he is a king. He isn't safe, but he is good, and he is a king. That's a portrayal. Walking with Jesus many times for us, we want everything to be safe and in order. We want to get up, we want to have a good family, we want to have a good job, we want to get good money to pay the bills. Everything should be in order. And after that, one good old day for no reason, we all die. And some people may cry or may not cry. And then it's done. Is that all there is to life? If I ask you a question today, how many of you all, I do not want you all to raise your hands and embarrass yourselves, would honestly tell me, my life is fun and I'm enjoying it. I want to come and talk to you. Talk to me, Pastor. Come and I will tell you what fun it is every day to get up, to go to work, to enjoy, to do, see all those wonderful co-workers and to see my wonderful boss of all people. It's so fun, Pastor. I want to tell you, give me an hour of your time. I'll definitely give you an hour. How many of you would honestly tell me, it's fun, my life is fun. Walking with Jesus is so joyful, it's so adventurous. I'm seeing things happen. There are some things that he has called me to do. Things are happening outside. How many of you would be able to honestly tell me, yes, My life was like that at one point in time. But I was restless. So the first thing God had to do to create some adventure into my life, he took away my job. <laughs> and he said, it's time to go on a journey with me. It's going to be fun. And I still remember this Korean pastor 
while you were just watching my life, watching my journey, he said, I'm watching your life, and this is the analogy I can give you for the things that are happening. Strap on your seat belt. You're on a roller coaster, and God promises you safe landing. He said, you're on a roller coaster. It's going to be fun. Endure those moments. But God promises you a safe landing. And that stuck with me. I said, it's going to be fun. Yes, those moments, yes, it was like dipping right down, and then I just come up. And then there was a safe landing. How many of us want to get into that adventurous life that God has for us? To walk with him. And in order to do that, you need to hear. You need to hear from God. This is what I said. It's very clear in the scriptures that at the time when the grain is ripe, he's coming looking for fruit. He'll put the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So this is the mystery of kingdom growth. Let's look at what is, a, what is the problem. The next slide, please. There is a problem in this mystery. So why is it then not happening? If this is how the kingdom has to grow, it's not happening, there is a problem, correct? So the mystery of kingdom growth, the kingdom growth is not your responsibility or my responsibility. It is God's. God is responsible to take care of the kingdom growth. God's responsible. Now, Let's look at the problem. Why is there a problem? Next slide. This country which was founded by those fathers on the principles of the word of God, if you all would have been in tune with what was happening last week, on October 8, 2015, there was a bring your Bible to school day. How many of your, how many of your kids took the Bible to school? Public schools. Last year, when Focus on the Family did this program, they encouraged them. There are 8,000 people, 8,000 kids who responded, and this year, 100,000 kids were so excited. They think taking the Bible, bring your Bible back to, bring your Bible to school day. The silence is deafening. We need to, Pastor, have a bring your Bible to church day very soon. <laughs> I'm going to consult with him, and maybe we'll have one soon. Bring your Bible to church day. We're all so convinced that the phone is all very sufficient for us. The Bible, the Word of God, the only book, the only book that was written over a period of 1,400 years in three continents, in three original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, by 40 different authors, and still is so coherent in the message of love for humankind. The greatest book of all time. The greatest book of all time. You know, even Donald Trump agrees with me. <laughs> it looks like some of you don't agree with me. He agrees with me. It is the greatest book of all time. You can ask me my favorite verses, I can tell you. But we need to know the scripture. Only when we know the word of God. What does the word of God tell us? What does the word of God tell us? You know, one of my mission, one of my ideas, or a desire in my heart is, Make this Bible come alive in the hearts of people. It's so fun when you read some stories. You want to know how a quarrelsome wife looks like? Or it's like a leaky roof on a rainy day. It's like we have a leaky roof sometimes. They're working on the roof. You need to give some money for that for our church. There's a roof here. When the rain comes, the snow comes, it will leak. Water will leak. And the Bible gives a description. A quarrelsome wife or a nagging wife is like a leaking roof on a rainy day. I know men are like, ah, good, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> but you don't know how dumb some men can be in the Bible, like Nabal. His story is found in 1 Samuel 25. Nabal. 
and his heart became like a stone. He had a heart failure. And there are some wonderful stories about kids who have a pig's brain, if you know what I mean. <laughs> who go to the pig's side before they have to come back. There are so many stories, so much fun in knowing the word of God. If only we could do something about it. So what is the problem in this mystery? Let's look at this. The problem is you and me. Why do I say that? Matthew chapter 21. What do you think? Jesus again goes through a parable. So the first one, the mystery of kingdom growth, God's responsibility. Problem in the mystery is you and me. Why do I say that? What do you think? He asked the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and he tells them a story. There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later, he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The next one. Next slide. The first they answered, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors who were demeaned at, the, at that time and the prostitutes who were outcasts in the society who were supposed to be stoned to death are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. I believe very strongly, very firmly, this captures for me the problem in Christianity. This captures for me the problem in Christianity, in our faith. You know, many of us, many of us, are in this category, most of the Christians. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will. How many of us, when we stood up last week or the previous week, he said, yes, Lord, I will. Oh, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for the iPhone alone. <laughs> I'll give you everything, Lord. I will surrender all. And you go out, nothing you've done. You have surrendered nothing. There is a problem. But this guy, he said, I will not. And what did he do? He changed his mind and went. I'm going to spin this around and make it, make it an upside down uh, message. So to me, because even in Christ's uh, view of the kingdom, it's always an upside down kingdom. We need people who will say, I will not, and go out and say, I will do it. <coughs> because it's become a routine in churches. People say, yes, I want to do this. You feel so good about it when you hear it. And then there's no action. I wish there are more people today who will now say, Pastor, what you are saying, what the word of God says is difficult. I will not do it. And then you go out. And during the week, when the spirit of God reminds you, you get into the word of God and you say, I'm going to do this. You will be blessed. You are the blessed one. You are the blessed one. You are the blessed one. There's a problem in the mystery. There is a problem. And the problem is you and me. We are the problem. As I told you, when you come into God's kingdom, it's an upside down kingdom. So you think everything should be perfect, normal. No. Once you walk into his way, 
It's going to be adventurous, so to speak. You will face injustice. You will have to look at some people or be in relationship with your family members who rub you on the wrong side. It's going to take something out of you. You got to forgive, you got to endure. There is no other way out. People will call you a devil. Because they call Jesus Beelzebub. You do not want Jesus to call you a devil. You want other people to think that you are a Satan or a devil, but not Jesus. Because Jesus looked at Peter and said, you're a devil, get thee behind me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. How many of us will get into that category where Jesus would tell us today, you do not have in mind the things of God, the things of the kingdom. You have in mind the things of men, the world. How many of us will receive that? How many of us will have to take that word and Jesus, literally, the one on whom he built the church, Peter, he told him, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't mince any words. He did not mince any words. He was direct. We need to check, examine our hearts today. Will you say no and do it? Will you say no and do it? I would like to see more Christians who would say no, but go and do the work of God's kingdom. An upside down kingdom. There's a problem in this mystery. Thirdly and finally, how to solve this problem? Solving the mystery. We need to solve the mystery. And here, as I said, the first, the mystery of the kingdom growth is completely God's responsibility. The problem in the mystery is you and me. Solving the mystery requires God and us. We got to cooperate with him. We need to work with you. You cannot do it on your own. You will not be able to do it on your own. How do we solve the mystery? You can solve the mystery with God, with his help. Because it is said, Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of God that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of you, this scripture should catch you. The spirit of the living God indwells you. He will also give life to your mortal bodies. That means he will help you to do impossible things. Impossible things. Because God is a God who specializes in the impossibilities of man. Because he said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. Are you willing to enter into this adventure with him? And he's going to ask much of you. Your world is going to turn upside down. But I tell you, it's going to be adventurous. It's going to be fun as you see God doing certain things through you in partnership with you because his heart is for those people who do not know him. And you and I are here saying, I know Jesus. How do you reflect his glory? How do you reflect his splendor to him, to the people who need to see Jesus, because they are also created in the image of God. And God's heart is for the lost. Amen. What are the things? I'm going to use Kyle Eidelman. He's the author of a book called Not a Fan. And he's written another book, which is called The Aha Moment. And these are the three principles he gives us. Awakening, honesty, and action. This is how we do it. You, when you open the word of God, I know many of us, we all read the word. We love God's word. You know, you cannot stop there. Love 
is not only a noun, it's a verb. It has to move you into action. It's like the culture that I come from. The men don't even tell the women, I love you. They live for 60, 70 years, 60 years, 50 years in marriage. They don't even tell the woman that they love. I know some of you all just say, I can't stay there. That's why you're here in America. Good for you. But for the people there, the men, they show it in action. They don't even say a word, but they deliver. Of course, many kids, India is one of the big populated areas, right? So there are many kids too. Of course, we've beaten by China. Chinese are better than us now at doing that. So in action, the love, the love should move you into action to do something. When you look at the status of things, what are happening, what are you going to do about it? It's going to require something out of you. You can't just come in, sit down, and then just go back. If the church, the kingdom of God has to move ahead, John, uh, in, uh, in Matthew 11, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is moving ahead with force, and only the violent people who are strong, aggressive, they take the kingdom of God. Many of us are not moving in the kingdom realm. We are still in the earthly realm. Because only when you enter into the kingdom realm, you start facing some opposition. The enemy will get your attention. Or you will get the enemy's attention. And if you do not have the enemy's attention, unfortunately, you are not moving in the kingdom realm. The enemy will come only when you're moving in God's kingdom. He's going to come after you. He will. But remember, like what we just heard this morning, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So this principle of awakening, honesty, and action, how does it happen? You open the word of God, and it says, I know some of y'all are thinking, what am I going to say right now? They're scared, and they're saying, Lord, don't tell me this. I don't want to do this, Lord. Please, tell me anything that you want, but not this. But God's telling some of you, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. Then enter into the kingdom of God. He told it to a rich, young lawyer who kept all the rules. He said, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. Everything, Lord. I've done it. I've kept all the commandments. I'm a good guy. And Jesus said, sell everything that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. I know many of you all thought, not me. It's for that person. Oh, it's not me. But God's telling some of us. For some of us, he's saying, I've invested much in you. Let down your nets and follow me. Let down your nets and follow me. Would you trust me? Would you get out of your comfort zone, out of your boat? And will you follow me? You can ask somebody. It's an upside down kingdom. He changes things around. That's when the adventure begins. That's when the adventure begins. Otherwise, we are just coasting. We can just coast till the end. But there's no fun. There's no adventure. Nothing's going to happen. But in order to shake up this kingdom, or to move ahead with this kingdom, you need to step into the realm of impossibilities. That very thing that you think that you cannot do, that very thing you are dreaming and saying, I would like to be this, but can I do this, Lord? That's the thing that God will do in your life. Amen. Not what you think is possible. Not that thing that you think it's within your realm of possibilities. Something that is beyond you. Something that you cannot do. He's going to ask you to do. And then he will say, watch me. Watch me accomplish this with you. You come along with me. I will go along with you. So you awaken. You awaken to this possibility. He's telling you to do something. He's telling some people, oh, you got to forgive this person. No matter what they've done. 
No matter what they've done to you, you need to forgive them. You need to reconcile. I died for you while you were still a sinner. Would you let that go? I know they hurt you. I know it hurts. I know it's tough. Don't hold it. Let that go. Be free and come and follow me. And you'll be set free. It's going to be a tough one. That's a tough one. So when you open God's word, I don't know, I have prayed that God will speak things into your heart and into your life as to what he wants to do according to his will that needs to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have prayed that God will work in your heart as you're sharing this word, that he's going to plant some impossible things in your mind. And it will not be normal. It will not be the things that people would think. They will think, they should think, you are crazy. They should think you're crazy. Why would you do that? You got everything lined up for you. You got a great future. You got to leave everything here in America and you're going to go to that Africa, that country there, and you're going to serve some people. With the gift and the talent that God has given you. You're crazy. You've got everything lined up for you, going well for you. But God will call you. There are so many people out there, young people who have taken that decision, and they are moving forward. Young people. We think so low of the young people of this age. Yes, we are all into the iPhone and all that stuff, but there are people, even in that generation, whom God is raising up as pillars of faith. As people who are so adventurous, who want to go and do God's kingdom work. Because one of the reasons why some of the young people, the younger generation is staying out of the church, they say, is because they do not see authenticity inside the church. We can't blame them. We can't tell them, oh, they're not coming in. No, they're looking for something. This generation is looking for authenticity of genuineness. They want to see. If you say you're a Christian, they want to see it. They don't want to just hear it. That's why things have become very difficult for you and me. They want to see it. They can see it right through. And many young people have been disappointed, and that is why they remain outside the walls, and they're not inside here. We need to take it. We need to share a part of the blame. You awaken when God speaks. You awaken. He said, aha, yes, I know it. Second step, honesty. Honestly acknowledge, yes, Lord. It's tough for me to forgive. It's tough for me to let go. But you are telling me to let this go. I will. What are the next steps? Take action. Pick up that phone and call. I'm going to share a testimony of one of our uh, sisters in this church who I think a couple of months ago she listened to the message and she went back home and she was seated and this one particular person owed her a lot of money so what she did she took out a letter uh, paper and she wrote a letter a scathing letter saying how can you do this to me it's time that you give me back this money I need this you can't just keep delaying, protracting this for so long. It is mine. You need to give it back to me. She wrote a letter. That Sunday night. Monday morning she got up. The Spirit of God spoke to her and said, No, that's not the way you do it. I need you to tear up that letter. She responded. The next day, or I do not know whether it's the same day, or the next day, she went to the mailbox. She picked up a letter from that lady who had put part of the money that was due to her, saying, I'm going through some difficult circumstances, but here is the part of that money that I owe you. If she had missed God's voice at that moment, just imagine what could have happened. She let it go. She forgave. And Lord, God took over and she delivered. 
it's time. It's time to take action. It's time to take action. You awaken, you be honest before God, and you take action. He's saying this is how it will work. I'll close with two verses for you. The first verse is from We all live in the so-called a lonely world sometimes. We say, I do not have a friend. Can there be a good friend? You really need a friend? Jesus is a friend. You can be Jesus' friend, but there's only one condition. He said, you are my friends if you do what I command. You will be Jesus' friend when you do what he commands. We all want, we sing that beautiful song, I am a friend of God. Yes, but that just doesn't qualify you at all. You are a friend of God, you are a friend of Jesus, only if you do what he commands you to do. He will be your friend. The second verse is from James chapter 4, verse 17. It says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do, you all heard today. And you all know what the good that you have to do. You all know what the good that you have to do. I believe God has spoken clearly into your heart. James gives it to us straight. You don't do it, it is a sin. You don't do the good that you ought to do. James describes it as a sin. James describes it as a sin. I do not want any of us to be guilty of this sin, of not knowing the good that you are supposed to do. And I believe God has laid or he has sprouted the seed inside of you that will grow according to your gifts and abilities to trust him for the impossibility. Would you do it today? Would you do it today? Remember the great I am is with you. The great I am is with you. Say no, but do it. Say no, but do it. Say no, but do it. Be like that son who did what God wanted him to do and become a friend of Jesus. Would you stand and sing that wonderful song again? The great I am because he is with you and he will go with you, enable you to do what you have to do. I want to be close, be close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels. 